Welcome to episode 100. My name is Rachel and I live just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. We are experiencing a very hot summer. Um, it's been in the 30s and um, pretty much all week. Um, I just got back from the gym. I'm all flushed, so I'm sorry if my face is all red. I jumped in the shower and uh, I ran down and set everything up and um, so I'm just running on a little bit of adrenaline this morning. It was a really hard workout and my hands, I don't know if you can see, my hands are all <laughs> chewed up. I said to my neighbor, who's not, she's not a knitter, so she won't be watching this, um, and she's she's not into sports at all. She's. I was like, yeah, look, look at my hands, and she's like, that's not sexy. <laughs> I was like, mm, but isn't it though, just a little? She laughed. Um, Anyways, um, we had a great workout this morning, So, but my hands are a little bit chewed up. So um, yeah, just you know that adrenaline of like a really great workout um, is sort of coming down off of that. So in today's show, um, I just have one really quick reminder for housekeeping um, in terms of the July giveaway. We'll draw that in August. Um, it's just the nests that I showed last show. I'm not going to take them out of the bag and stuff. Um, sorry for the glare of the light. Um, it's just the nests for um, the giveaway. There's a prompt that you need to answer. If I can remember what it is, I can't remember. Um, we did new spinner stories last time. And then what was the prompt for this time round? Um, oh, Linda and Rebecca, that's awesome. You guys are together. Um, I don't know why the stream keeps. What was the prompt? I can't remember what the prompt was. Oh well. If you guys watched episode 99, you'll know um, what it was. So our kids are playing outside with um, our neighbor's daughter, um, the one that told me my hands weren't sexy. So uh, they're playing outside. Um, all right, so the nests are for the giveaway for July, and you guys can um, enter in the July episode thread in the Ravelry group. You need to make sure that you are a member of the group. Um, and we will um, draw that in August. And then we had a giveaway for, did I announce? Yes, I did. Okay, I'm just getting um, mixed up with all the giveaways. Because remember last show, there were so many giveaways and I was like, had to record it separately because there was just so many and I got like, it was just overwhelming how many giveaways. So I just am making sure that we're kind of through that because there's also a giveaway um, coming up, uh, another one coming up on Woolen Spinning Radio as well. So there's a there's a giveaway for that coming up and then there's also this giveaway for, for our regular July episode that's for everybody. So even if you're not a patron of the show, which is totally fine, I love that you're here and I love that you're watching. Um, welcome if you're new to the show and you haven't watched before. Um, this giveaway is for everyone. You just need to pop into the Ravelry group, Wool and Spinning, and um, find the July episode thread. Ellen, you're not too late. You can you can enter right up to the end of July. I, I don't lock the thread, but any posts that come in after the end of the month, so like if somebody enters the giveaway like August 1st, I just, unfortunately, I don't include it because that, that entry can go into the August giveaway, if that makes sense because it's a monthly giveaway now because we hit that Patreon tier that was a monthly giveaway on the show, which is really great. So, all right. Hi, Florence. Um, okay, so let's get into the show. I've got um, a spinning growth chat to do today. I don't think it'll be a long chat about um, um, Becca's post. It was the, I'm, I've kind of just been going in order so far through the spinning growth, growth thread. Um, so we've got um, Becca's yarn to talk about. Um, and then I've got a new spin in progress, which you can see here at the back um, um, on the bobbin. I got a new book in the mail, which I'll chat about really quickly. And then I just want to talk about some of my works in progress that I've been working on while we were away this past week. And I'll talk a little bit about um, knitting on the road. So um, yeah, let's just get right into the show.
on with the show. Um, okay, so for spinning growth, um, let's let's start with Becca's yarn, um, and we'll talk about um, what she wrote. I had just have to reload it because I hadn't reloaded it before. It's funny, you know, because thanks, thanks, um, Rebecca, for saying, um, you know, that you're sorry that we're having trouble. It's funny because in all of the episodes, because we've been live streaming for a while now, like it's been. I don't know if you guys can remember, but it's like we've been live streaming since January. Um, and I feel really grateful for how much problems we haven't had. Like we had an issue last show at right at the end, but we've really not had any problems. Like touch, touch wood that this is something that we can deal with in time. But really, like this is the first time that we've really had an issue. So um, I'm sorry to those who this is your first show and you've not been here before. Um, it's just stressful and it's annoying really for me. Um, I know it's annoying for you guys, but it's just I want things to work and I want things to really look nice for you guys so you can we can just talk about spinning. Um, all right, let's get into spinning growth. So um, if the live stream just keeps connecting and disconnecting and it's really bugging you. I'm really sorry. Oh, I have to clap um, <laughs> to match up the audio. Um, if you guys um, just want to watch the show when it gets released, I totally understand and hopefully we'll have everything tip top for next show. We might even do like a trial live stream in the next couple weeks and make sure that everything's running okay and um, that would kind of be like a bonus. Um, I'll, I'll sort of see how, how things go in terms of trying to fix all this. So, because if it's a YouTube problem, there's really nothing we can do. So maybe that'll put a fire under my butt to get me using the Patreon live stream. So, all right, let's talk about Becca's yarn. So Becca posted in post number five, um, cool idea for a segment. Thanks, Becca. Um, I have so many spins that didn't exactly work out or are out and out disappointing. I totally get it. And her and I have talked about that actually extensively, just the two of us about like how you have such high hopes for certain spins and then you finish them and you're so disappointed. Um, I will share one to start off with that is from two years ago and I really don't like it. So she, one sec. The kids are playing with a neighbor and they're out front and Mike is there, but they're knocking on the front door. So I don't think you guys can hear it, but I'm just ignoring them because they know that they can't have me right now. <laughs> Anyways, let me switch my cameras around and I'll show you Becca's yarn and I'll read uh, what she wrote about it. And she started with some, this is a silk spin, which is great because we haven't talked about silk recently. I'm not a big silk spinner for those who've been following me for a while. It's something that I haven't really delved into. Um, so she was really disappointed with this yarn. So I'm pretty sure she spindle spun it. Um, and she calls this her silk, I think she calls it her Mawata yarn. Um, oh, I did, Ellen. I put a new link on the Patreon page. Is it not working? Maybe reload the post because um, there is a new link there for it. Hopefully the link is working. Sorry guys, this is a very disjointed show. This is not what I wanted for episode 100. Let me just reload it for you guys and then hopefully that'll work and we can just move on. <clears throat> All right. So Becca wrote about this yarn. Okay, reload your Patreon post. Um, Um, let me see. So she had silk hankies. Um, this yarn disappoints me on multiple levels. Number one, it was only my second time spinning from Silk Mawata and it was a real struggle. Um, I like this idea. Number two, I had this idea to, um, to mix in some dyed Mawata with a whole bunch of undyed. In my head, I imagined the color kind of speckling throughout and did not and that did not happen. I ended up with weird stripes and a real visual mess. Number three, when I was finishing the yarn, a lot of dye came out of the colored sections and dyed the undyed bits. This made the mess of color even worse and a lot of muddying overlap as a result um, in some places. This yarn still sits in my stash and I have no idea when or if I will use it for something. Just looking at it irritates me explanation mark. So, um, so 
this is a really interesting situation because it's there's two things that came to my mind immediately. I'm not really going to talk to spinning the silk. Um, Becca's a beautiful spinner. She spins amazingly. She's incredibly consistent. So even though she hasn't even spun spilt mo silk mulatto for um, very, like very much, it was only her second attempt. Her yarn is just incredible. Um, it's got a beautiful twist angle because it's low twist. The singles were a little bit higher twist, I think, I think if I remember from her page... Um, her project page on on Ravelry um, and then she left it a lovely low twist um, when she plied it this would be just an incredible yarn for some lace knitting because in those sections um, of lace where the yarn overs are once you block it it would just really open out um, and the yarn um, if you've seen some of the photos that I've done and some of the sampling that I've done where you have um, yarns that are um, that really bloom when they're blocked when they're lower twist plied lower twist versus high high twist where they they just don't lay as nicely and they don't fill in those gaps and fill in those spaces a yarn like this is just going to be beautiful knit up into some lace but I also really understand what she means about the color play um, you know she was looking for a speckled kind of effect she was looking for more of like a, a confetti effect and what's ended up happening is she's got long stripes through her yarn and um, that's not what her what she was going for. So then, so so that's where my mind was going. Not in the spinning or in the twist angle, but more in the um, uh, what she, what how, what happened with the color management. So I have two thoughts. The first one is. It was her first time doing uh, Welcome Becca. She's just arrived. Um, there's two things. Number one, she was trying a brand new technique. So she was dyeing um, something. She had this idea in her mind and she was trying something new. Um, and so when I'm trying something new, I always try to give myself this massive amount of leash because the chances are it's not going to turn out. Um, and so I try to give myself like this huge... Um, leash of sort of tolerance if you will around what I think it may or may not look like and I try to have really low expectations Becca and I think very similarly a lot of this about a lot of this stuff so I know that she would have been thinking about that as well um, but basically the those those long color stretches when you when you've dyed um, this the silk um, as soon as you stretch it out and and like Becca knows this as soon as you stretch it out you're gonna end up with those long color repeats so there's so what I was gonna say when I initially read this post was that I I think if it was me knowing what her and I know now and what we've all seen with the skein and how it turned out in the end um, I think what would be a great experiment is to do it again but not to dye it beforehand so um, I would almost try an experiment where you spin the silk make the yarn that you want to make and then dye it afterwards and see if you can get the effect that you wanted um, or even and get the effect let me just finish that thought um, finish get the effect that you want by dyeing the yarn afterwards instead of trying to dye it before and then spin the fiber um, because as soon as you've got speckling on anything or you've got color blocks of color in fiber as soon as you stretch it out you've got a length automatically it's not gonna speckle it, it you just you can't create that in spinning fiber very easily I'm not gonna say you can't do it at all it's just not very easy um, Oh, I didn't show the braid because she had, um, let me pull it up, Candy, because she, it was um, silk hankies. Um, so let me show you, I'll see if I can, while I'm talking, I'll see if I can pull it all up and I can show you um, the photos here. So the, the other thing that I was going to say was because she had plied it, um, color kind of speckling throughout, um, was what she had said and so instead she kind of ended up with with what she calls weird stripes I think it's actually a really gorgeous hank of yarn um, I think it would be amazing woven up actually I think you could really make some gorgeous hankies with it like some some silk um, hankies um, woven um, the the thing the other thing that you could do because it's silk you could actually speckle dye it or do some sort of that type of dyeing space dyeing of some kind um, on the so spin the single skein them and then dye them and then you could have actually plied them with a plain white undyed singles and then that would have given you that that 
barber pulling and that color twisting in certain sections. Does that make sense? Um, which would be really cool. I wonder why there's a reverberation in my voice. Is it still happening? Because I've turned off all of the other microphones. Um, let me find the photo, the photos. Yeah, using it as warp yarn would be amazing, Becca. So she was saying that um, weaving is an excellent thought. The crazy thing about um, weaving that I've really found, because I weave for the um, um, How I Spin content every uh, month, so there's a knitted swatch and then there's usually a woven swatch unless the content doesn't lend itself but more often than not I do a woven swatch and it's really kind of amazing how much I see um, the weaving just changes how the color is managed like it, it breaks it up um, it changes how it just changes how how everything works um, it's really amazing um, so this is what she started with See if it loads. So I'm not sure, I guess in the UK, Becca, you guys don't call these silk hankies, but that's what we would call them here. Oh, you know what? Let me put them down here. I wasn't even thinking. Uh, oh no, I can't. I'm on the wrong camera. Oh my gosh. Now I'm getting all mixed up. Um, because of course the show is... So those are what silk hankies look like. So these ones were cream white. They were undyed first. And then she dyed some of them. So she spun some of them and then she dyed some of them. And I have to say like the colors that she dyed them are just amazing. Even just um, doing some, um, like weaving some swatches, um, Zwalu uh, mentioned, mentions that in the live stream, like just even doing some woven swatches, like if you have access to a zoom loom or something or a pin loom. And so those are the colors that she dyed it. Aren't those amazing? Like the one on, the, um, on my lower left, the one that's the greens and purpley reds and there's, some, there's just still some undyed cream in there. I mean, that is just incredible. It's so beautiful. Yeah, so I... Um, we, I think I've heard, I have heard them referred to as Moata, Moata. Um, I usually when you're like at a fiber show or when you're in like a booth or something and you're looking at stuff, they're usually labeled as um, silk hankies in, in North America for those who aren't sure what, I, what I'm talking about when Becca and I say silk Moata. Um, but yeah, they're silk hankies and they, like when you, when you find them in like a booth or whatever, and you walk in and they're, they're usually hanging like all together in one section. They are just incredible when they're dyed. And I think I've talked on previous shows. For those who've been here for a really long time, you can remind me. I know I teach this when I do beginning spinning. Um, there's um, a sort of a way that you can prep them and to, in order to spin them. And um, you can break a hole in the middle and you can pull them and pull them and pull them. The crazy thing about silk hankies is they're layered. So you have to pull off layer by layer by layer. It's like it's like peeling tissue paper back, only it's even finer. Um, and you can get just incredible amounts of yardage out of them. Um, I've only spun them a few times, and I don't even think I've spun them for the show. I think it's all been projects that I've worked on outside of the show, like either before I started the podcast or because I've, I'm teaching um, and I... I'm teaching it in class, so I'm spinning it in class. So they're not really projects that I think of to like bring onto the show and talk about. I have to admit, for me personally, um, yes, there's, they can be super sticky. Um, they're, it's not my favorite thing to spin. Silk has never been my favorite thing to spin. I have played a lot with silk um, because of teaching mostly, and it's just not my favorite thing. Like I, I could take or leave silk, and it's funny because some people out there, like my friend Kim, she absolutely loves t spinning silk. She loves teaching it. She loves everything to do with silk. She's studied it. Um, yeah, and it's just not my thing. And maybe it's just because I haven't delved deep enough. I don't know. Maybe it's one of those things that I, I haven't done enough of. Um, but yeah, it's just not my, 
it, at this point in my spinning career, it's not my favorite thing. I'd rather delve into the plant-based fibers um, than spin silk. And that's just kind of where I'm at in my spinning journey. And everybody's different. But a yarn like this, I, I, I get what, what Beck is saying about some of her um, frustrations around it. Um, I'm just going to get caught up in the in the live stream and just catch up with what people are saying. Oh, interesting. Becca says Moada comes from the Japanese and it means to spread out, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, I agree, Kelly. Her colors, are, that she dyed beautiful. Um, yeah, it's definitely silk is a different way of spinning. Um... Spin. I've thought about trying silk hankies as an intro to silk, but had only seen people spin them fairly thick. Didn't know you could get them very fine. You can get them thread fine. Um, when you see somebody spinning from a silk hanky who is a silk spinner, um, it's really incredible what they can do and the consistency that they can get. And um, like they'll draw back and they'll spin it long draw and it just gets finer and finer and finer. And it'll be just totally thin 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 it's just amazing to watch um, if you can watch somebody spin silk who is a, an accomplished silk spinner it's really amazing it's really cool all right I've got some other stuff to talk about so I'm gonna mix around the uh, cameras um, yeah Becca's right they'll always have a little bit of texture because then other preps of silk because of the way that silk hankies are prepped it's almost like a woolen prep um, Let me just get the pop-up chat back every time I switch my cameras the pop-up chat goes away so um, how how's the stream is it a little bit smoother now or is it still starting and stopping how are you guys finding that um, oh yeah that would be awesome to spin silk for embroidery and for inkle weaving that's a great idea rain I hadn't even thought of that I have to admit I would love to spin my own cruel um, is it cruel wool what's it called for embroidery I would love to eventually work towards doing that um, I just haven't had, it's not that I haven't had time. I have time to create. I just, ha it hasn't been at the top of my list for priorities, but that's something that I'd really like to work towards. Um, oh, good. I'm glad that it's good now. I'm so glad. Um, you guys are amazing at giving me feedback and like helping me when things aren't going really super well. You're so patient and you're so kind. So props to you guys. You're the best. Um, so we were away last week. We went up into, um, for those who are kind of familiar with the West Coast, um, there's mountains on like every single side of us. So all the way up the West Coast, there's the Rockies, the Cascades, there's just all these mountains. So we decided to, um, so I'm from up there. Um, I'm from the interior of British Columbia originally. And so we decided, my husband never driven up what's called the Fraser Canyon. So it follows the Fraser River all the way up. And it's a huge, um, it used to be the only way that you could get to the interior of British Columbia. It used to, it used to be the only road. Um, and um, if you keep driving up there, you'll eventually get to Prince George, and then you'll eventually get to Dawson Creek, and then you'll eventually go across, and you'll eventually end up in Alaska. Um, and so we drove up sort of more than three quarters of the way up, and um, we were just paddling for the week, camping, spending as much time as we could on the on the lake like we were just having a really um chill week that was the whole idea there's really nothing to do up there it's all outdoor stuff there's nothing touristy to go and look at there's really no like there's no shopping to do like there's just nothing up there it's like these little tiny hamlets of you know four or five hundred people um there's a, a lot of um first nation first nations culture up there and lots of that kind of stuff but there's really nothing to like go and do um and so it's a lot of like lake time and hiking and just hanging out and that's exactly what we needed so um when we were driving um i did take advantage and i did a lot of knitting so um let me move some stuff out of the way I know you guys are still talking about silk hankies in the chat, but I know I'm cognizant of your time. I'm cognizant of my time. And of course we had those technical difficulties. So I'm going to kind of keep on going and you guys um, can, can keep chatting. Um, so I've been working on my sun walker. So this is actually getting to be quite big. I'm about 180 stitches across. And um, I, I'm more than three quarters of the way um, towards building my the, this textured area. Um, and I kind of just kept my, I'm not sure that 
I think I've made a few mistakes um, as I've gone because there's you have to make increases on one side and I think a couple of times I didn't do the increases or like and I missed them. Um, the edge I know that that'll block out and it'll still be a smooth edge but I started off with um, this is like I think it's like 1100 or 1400 yards of yarn or something this monster monster ball of yarn and I'm actually starting to get through it. Like it's actually starting to decrease in size. Um, there's actually a huge hole in the middle of it now and it's starting to collapse in on itself and it's getting like physically lighter because I can't remember how many grams this is but it's it's a pretty big hank. I'm not sure if I put it in my hand spun page. I know I have a tag that has the information about it on it um, but it's in my basket. I don't want to start um, looking for it right now but this hank of yarn like it just feels like it's going on and on and on and I still have five more repeats so here are my markers to tell me how far I've I've like come and gone I have five more of these repeats of these it's not a chart it's a written out instruction and then I'll get to the charts next um, the Sunwalker is a triangular shawl it's asymmetrical it's by Melanie Berg I think um, yeah, it's Melanie Berg, isn't it? And you start off with this textured pattern and it kind of almost makes like one side, yeah, it's Melanie Berg. And you, you sort of make this one side of the shawl and you work your way across so that you end up with this, this just massive asymmetrical sort of, I, I call it the wing, I'm working on the wing right now. Um, and then you work your way through four charts. Um, and I think one of the charts repeats in that four, so I think there's only actually three charts, I think. Um, and then you work your way through all that lace and then there's an I cord bind off at the end which I really liked because um, I really like that finished edge because that's the edge of the shawl that will show um, this is taking forever so I think I can get through one repeat of this textured stitch like it's taking like over an hour to get through one repeat now and I still have five more to go so um, I I'm starting to kind of burn out on this project because of the amount of like textured stitch. Um, it's beautiful yarn. I'm really enjoying working with the yarn. My original plan with this yarn when I first spun it, and I did this on my Ashford E spinner um, when I first got it, because I wanted a really big project that would help me to really get a feel for the E spinner. And when I first got it in the new year, it would you know, I could spin a ton of yardage on it and really like put it through the gears of, of learning it. And if the yarn wasn't really super consistent, that was sort of okay. And I talked about that quite a bit on the show. But um, what I really like about this yarn is, it, so it's a, it's a mix of uh, alpaca, merino, silk, and nylon. So it's kind of this sock blend that they've been making at one of my local um, spinning shops out in, out in Abbotsford. It's from Brooklyn Brothers for those who are local and know um, where I'm talking about. Um, and I can't remember what the ratio, like what the percentages are in it. Um, and I would pull it up if I could find this yarn, but I, oh, there it is. Um, but I'm not sure that I wrote it in. I didn't. Um, so this, this was 230 grams and it was, um, 1,100 yards. So part of the reason why I chose this shawl was because of the size of the shawl and because I really wanted to use as much of the yardage as I possibly could. Um, my original plan with this yarn was actually to spin it into a three ply and I was gonna do socks with it. And then whatever was left over, I was gonna use for something else. And it's really interesting because I am really glad that I didn't do that because the yarn is so, it's, it's a really interesting yarn. It, when I spun the singles, I spun them quite high twist. And then when I plied them, I didn't ply them really super tightly. And it's interesting because the yarn itself is sort of almost like, I'm just gonna untangle this and you guys can really see what I'm talking about. Um, the, it's almost like the yarn is sort of a little bit underspun now, a little, just a little bit. Um, it, it could have taken like a good couple more twists to really like tighten it up. Cause that's the aesthetic for yarn that I really like. I like yarn that looks like this. Um, it's a little bit tighter in terms of, of the twist angle. And instead, it's 
what I would consider under plied. And that's part of just learning the e spinner and learning how long, like, you know, watching the twist angle and not feeding it in too soon. Because to plot, to, for it to end up like that, I probably needed to, to ply it like that. And then when I washed it, it would have relaxed sort of out to here. But the funny thing is, is that knitting with it, because the twist has ended up being more like what a commercial yarn would be like, so a little bit under twisted. Um, it, like a mass produced commercial yarn I'm talking about not not a really well produced commercial yarn um, but the funny thing is is I'm actually really enjoying it because I'm knitting this on 3.75 millimeter needles and you can see the fabric is like it, the yarn really fills in all of the gaps um, there's no holes in the knitting um, and I think when I do the the lace section um, because it's a two ply again the yarn overs will open up but the rest of the knitting will the, the holes will be filled. Um, so between the knit stitches, if that makes sense. And um, it just ends up making for like this really great drapey shawl. You know, it's soft. It probably isn't gonna be able to withstand like a, a ton of wear and tear, but it's a shawl. It's, it's not gonna get abraded particularly. So it was interesting kind of reflecting on that last week because my original plan for this yarn was very different from what it ended up being. And um, it's ended up really making a really nice fabric. It's a little bit thicker in places, again, because I was playing with the e-spinner and it's not the most consistent spinning that I've ever done. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of made this really neat yarn. And because of the silk in it and the nylon, um, it's quite a tough yarn. So in some ways, it's okay that it's under plied and it's okay that it's not super, super tight because it's still really strong. And it's funny because I was trying to like rip it um, at the other end, not at the end that I was knitting. Um, you can see that I've got it wrapped around the ball here because um, I was I had unwound a little bit of it from the other end and was trying to like pull it apart. I couldn't pull it apart, and it's it's let's let's face it. Most yarn you can just untwist, especially if it's 100% wool. You just untwist it, and then you can pull it apart, and it'll just drift apart when, once you get that twist out of it. This I I couldn't I couldn't break it, which is pretty it's pretty strong for not having a uh, twist angle that I really love. So um, it's funny how once you start working with your yarns, your opinion of them changes. You either really, really like them or you're like, oh, I wish I had done this differently or oh, I'm really glad I didn't make that decision for spinning and I'm glad I went with the two ply and I didn't do the three ply. It's kind of funny how our decisions inform how these yarns kind of work up in these projects and then subsequently the projects that we choose um, to make because I wouldn't have made a shawl a two you know this type of shawl in this type of pattern if I had done a high twist three ply um, part of the reason why I did end up doing it as a two ply is because it wasn't super consistent and I didn't want to have a thick and thin three ply for socks that would have been knit up at a higher gauge um, I don't I wouldn't have worn them so that's why I kind of abandoned that that thought and it was the whole purpose of the project was to put the new wheel kind of through the gears if you will to kind of to learn it so um, yeah it's just funny how that how how that worked out I'm really excited to uh, Kelly to see what the lace looks like because this is striping up a little bit this was I fiber that I dyed myself I've talked about it on previous shows so I'm not gonna go go too much in detail but I did dye it myself I just kettle dyed it on our stove and I was a little bit worried when I started spinning about all of the striping but from a distance I think I did this on a previous show too I showed it to you from a distance um, what it looks like like when it's actually like on me and it's funny how this sea foam kind of starts to take over in terms of what you see for color um, it's not it's not as, you, you still get the stripes, but it's not as stripey. Because you guys know how I feel about stripes and texture. It's not my favorite. But I think in this, it's actually quite, it actually works. It adds a little bit of interest. Unfortunately, on a camera, it doesn't really do it justice. This is where having these projects in person and being able to share with one another what our projects like look like in person is where the true beauty of what we make comes out right because on a camera it does make it a bit flatter and it does highlight those stripes whereas in person it's actually really seafoam 
um, sort of that bluey green soft kind of color. So yeah, uh, totally. <laughs> Candy says road trip to Rachel's. Yes, totally. Uh, one day. Um, I, everybody always says they want to come out to the West Coast. So like, come. <laughs> um, I find that kind of blend really difficult to get to get spun super even um, to to get super even fibers so different from the others. Florence, that's a great point. So one of the reasons why these blends are really hard to spin super evenly is because everything that's in the blend, the merino, the alpaca, the silk, and the nylon are all different lengths. So the nylon may have been cut to different lengths from the silk. The silk may have been cut to different lengths. Um, the merino is naturally a shorter stapled fiber and then you've got the alpaca which can be anywhere from a couple of inches to a few inches long to like quite long. Um, this blend was okay in terms of evenness but there was a few times and you can see it in the yarn itself where it really like fluffs up and it's pure merino. It was an area where there was nothing else present um, and that was actually one of the other reasons why I really abandoned that um, three ply. It just wasn't even enough. And and again, it was because I was testing out a new wheel um, and getting used to a new wheel. So again, being kind to my ourselves and not being too hard on ourselves when we're learning new equipment um, means that you end up with a yarn that you're like, yeah, that worked out. That was okay. I learned a lot and I still get a great knitted project out of it. All right. I can't believe it's already 20 after 11. It's just time just flies when we're talking. Um, all right, a woolen spinning retreat, wouldn't that be amazing? One day, one day. <laughs> I'm going to keep the cameras flipped around. Um, Eve's not here. She's the one in the, in the chat channel that always helps me remember to flip my cameras around. Um, I got 51 Yarns. This is a book by JC Boggs Faulkner. Um, you can buy it off of the Ply Magazine website. Um, I just started looking at it. It is a really interesting book. I haven't started reading it yet. I also got, and I showed it on a previous episode, and I seem to have misplaced it. Oh, it's on my bedside table, so it's upstairs. Um, I also got the big book of Fibery White Rainbows, which I have been reading. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. No, probably more like two thirds of the way through it. Um, and I said that I would chat about it on a, on a future um, episode. I wasn't asked to review these books. I wasn't asked to buy them or to anything like that. I bought them of my own volition for my own... Um, um, want basically um, and so I've been sort of um, interested to work my way through the two books um, this book is kind of interesting because the idea is that you look at a that you take the 52 weeks of the year and you work through a yarn a week I think I said 52 yarns I meant 51 yarns so the idea is that you sort of work your way through um, the idea is that by the time you get to the end of the book you have made all 51 yarns and you'll be sort of at the point where you've kind of seen it and done it all. You've tried every sort of, every, every quote unquote, yarn out there that there is to make and that you're sort of um, able to, um, that you've gained a lot of knowledge. So the book sort of goes through the classes of, yarn, of wool, um, the basics, so, you know, true wool and true worsted, um, and then uh, tail spinning, spinning the grease, and singles yarns, and then different structures of yarns, um, color management, and then um, switching ply, um, pl plying directions, variety of fibers, and then um, the rest of it is sort of, um, you know, getting outside of your comfort zone, um, and then finding a community we can all tick that off because we're all here. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, personal best, so um, which is kind of an interesting chapter. And the idea is that you sort of work through it on your own. It's a really interesting concept. I think it's a it's a really interesting book. The, the, I've read up to where Nora's little bookmark is here. Um, I've been reading it. I haven't been doing it. I'm not sure that I am going to do it. What I really liked about it was there um, is... Um, you can record what you do. So every every time you make your yarn, you can make your notes. You can tick it off that you did it, date it. Um, I know somebody who has this book, she's been taping um, a little tiny sample of her yarn and then her actual samples she's been keeping um, on a big um, O-ring, one of those big hook rings that open up, you know. 
um, she's been hooking she's been putting them on there with a tag which I thought was a great idea and there's lots of other ideas in the Ply Magazine group on Ravelry um, it's a really neat idea and I think it's a wonderful way for a not a true beginning spinner but somebody who's making that transition from being a beginning spinner to an intermediate spinner you're sort of in that process of making that transition um, to do a project like this maybe don't do one a week but like if you can chip off a couple a week and get it done like relatively quickly you would learn a ton um, you'd learn a lot about yourself and what you like to spin you'd learn a lot about the fibers out there that are available um, the only problem is that when you get into some of the fiber based ones like the like the, I think there's a, a silk one and a bast one and there's a whole bunch of different ones um, you're gonna need some fiber to spin some stash fiber um, so you know there will be a little bit of a cost to be able to sort of do it all that said um, it's a neat idea to sort of work your way through and maybe turn some of the spins into a slightly bigger project which is kind of a great idea um, and then some of the yarns you're going to absolutely love and you're going to want to spin more of that specific project. So um, the one thing I will say about a book like this is um, it gives people like myself who, who are sort of doing some teaching and are um, interacting with a lot of spinners of lots of varying um, uh, skill levels. It gives us like it gives me a, something to recommend to somebody else to say, hey, like this is this would be something that would be really great for you to keep advancing yourself and to keep learning and to keep moving forward because it's more of a project based book. It's not a book that you're going to sit down and read cover to cover like I am. You're going to work your way through it one page at a time like a journal, which is really great. Um, I, I have some ideas percolating in the back of my mind about how to apply a book like this to a community like ours. Um, and I'm just kind of percolating in the back of my mind about what that maybe would look like. So. Um, yeah, I, it's really interesting, but I'm going to keep on reading and I'm going to work my way through the rest of the book. Um, all right. Yeah, Tiny Fiber Studio, she's been doing a bunch of videos on this book. So if you're interested in learning more and kind of getting into more of the nitty gritty details, um, definitely good, good thought rain. Um, check out her videos because, um, yeah, that, she's been very interesting. <coughs> um, oh, a question about the two ply versus the three ply and being more even. When you ply an ink, a, a yarn that's not super, super consistent, where the, the singles aren't super consistent, when you ply it into a three ply, it's going to be a more consistent yarn than a two ply will be. The reason why I didn't choose to do the to do that in this situation with this yarn, um, great question by the way, good good pickup um, is because I didn't want a thicker yarn so a, a three ply is gonna you're gonna you're adding a third single so it's just gonna naturally be a thicker yarn and because those thick spots where it kind of bloomed um, especially where that merino was um, it was already a little bit too thick for socks and then putting it into a three ply it would have just been I just wouldn't have worn them they're just too thick um, our weather here is too mild all year round to need socks that have alpaca in them and then to make them a three ply it would have been too dense so that's why I went with the two ply abandoned my plan made a two ply that was a light fingering instead of a sport weight and um, did the shawl so I hope that answers your question yeah all right let's talk about my, my second to last project and um, do you guys want to do socks first or do you want to do spinning first I have two projects you guys tell me um, I found the fiber that I couldn't find. Remember last show I told you I'd looked for a couple hours and I could not find it anywhere? I found it. So, um, do you guys want to do socks or fiber? And I'm going to take advantage and wet my whistle. Kelly said socks. Rebecca said spinning. Kelly was first, so we'll do, we'll do the socks. Oh, more people are saying socks. Okay, so, um, I might have to hold these back here. So I finished my first bamboo... Uh, no, sorry, vegan cashmere and superwash BFL sock. So remember, I had blended this fiber up on my um, hackle. And um, this is going to be part of some of the um, sock content for our sock theme in the fall. Um, I'm going to be talking more and more about this yarn and more in depth about this yarn. But this is the first sock. It knit up beautifully and it knit up so 
fast. I couldn't believe it. I knitted on 2.25 millimeter needles. Um, I have no idea what that is in US sizing. So if anybody knows, if you could just pop that in there, that would be great. Um, so this is the first sock. And so I have the second one going and I'm already past the heel. I, I turned the heel um, yesterday actually. No, on Friday, Thursday, Thursday. And um, I'm already halfway up the leg, uh, probably a third of the way up the leg. So I, I'm getting there. So these are being knit on 2.25 millimeter needles, like I said. And then while we were away, and actually the bonus episode that's going to be released um, either with this episode or the next week, it depends on when I can get the video editing done. Um, the other socks was this yarn. So you guys will remember this yarn. I talked about it in the last episode. It was finished. And this is the uh superwash bfl nylon so 8515 and this was 5050 vegan cashmere um superwash bfl so crafty jacks bfl and then vegan cat and then vegan yarns uh vegan cashmere um i started these at the same time because my plan was to knit one of these one yellow one of these the second yellow and i got knitting and these are on 2.25 millimeter needles as well and the gauge of these two yarns is the same. So these two yarns in terms of weight, like when you do your wrap sprint and you figure out your knitting weight, they are exactly the same. Look at how beaten up my hands are from this morning. Isn't that terrible? <sighs> um, they're the same. But when I started to knit, this ended up being a slightly thinner yarn. Um, so when I started knitting, um, there's a lot more elasticity in this yarn than there is in the other one. Um, it's just spun slightly differently. It's, they're both three ply. Um, and so when I started knitting, and you guys will see this right away, it's too loose. You can see my fingers. See how loose that fabric is? So I have to rip them out. So I got here on them. Um, I got sort of halfway up the foot, just over halfway. And I kept saying to Mike when we were driving, I was like, mm, it's too loose. Mm, it's too loose. I don't think it's tight enough. Mm. And I kept knitting. And then I finally said to him, I'm going to stop knitting and start the yellow ones. As soon as I started knitting the yellow ones, I was like, yeah, these are too loose. It was almost like I needed the comparison between the two before I could really commit to, yeah, these are too loose. And I'm going to pull the needles out because I don't need, I'm going to rip this out. I just had saved them um, until I could show them to you guys. When you put them on the sock form, you can really see how loose they are because they're like bunching out. They don't, they don't sit tightly enough on the sock form. Um, and when you pull them, you can, I don't know if you guys can see it. I can see it. I can see right through them. I can see the camera through the foot because there's, there's the hole here. I can see right through. See how it's, it's just really too bad, but it was a good reminder. Um, just because your wraps per inch are the same on various yarns doesn't mean they're going to knit up at the same gauge. I'm going to go down to a two millimeter needle from a 2.25 millimeter needle. And I'm hoping that that'll make them tight enough because the idea is this fall to get these two pairs of socks done relatively quickly. Um, so that I can do a comparison test between the two. So between the, um, uh, vegan cashmere superwash BFL and the superwash BFL nylon and sort of see which sock wears better. Um, mostly just for my own like edification. Heidi doesn't carry this vegan cashmere anymore. Um, she's um, sort of letting it go because of environmental reasons. Um, so the it was sort of I had it in my stash and I thought oh this would be kind of a fun comparison to do. Um, and just to see like if the vegan cashmere really is a more cool um, has a sort of a more cooling effect and whether or not it's more, um, like just the comfort and the long-term wear and whether or not the nylon really does help the socks to wear longer. Um, B I find my BFL socks do kind of rough up a little bit. They get a bit fuzzy from the longer staple of the BFL anyhow. Um, but I, I sort of, I'm curious to see what these 
um, how these socks will wear long term. Um, I will say the yellow socks, you can't really see it here, although maybe you can kind of see it on the lower one because it's on the sock form. The sheen from the BFL and the cashmere, it's pretty stunning. And as I'm knitting along, there's a couple of spots that um, uh, you, I know it's all one fiber or the other, like it wasn't as well mixed in that particular area. And um, it's it's kind of neat to see because as it goes along, like some of the fiber is just, um, yeah, not as well mixed and it's like got more of a sheen or it's got a smoother texture or it's sort of more, more wooly and a little bit more BFL. Um, I'm really enjoying working on them and I think that's why they're getting done so quickly. So look at that, got that done and I'll recast those on this weekend. So I worked yesterday and then um, I'm off for the rest of the weekend and I'm back in on Tuesday. So I'm hoping um, that I can get a good start on the blue ones and get those done. So those are them again. They've got kind of almost like a, like they're really, really mustard yellow. Not like Dijon mustard, like French's mustard, but they, they almost kind of have like an underlying, like kind of green to them. Um, Anyways, I love this color. You guys can, you guys know how much I love this color. Um, so those are almost done and they're just really fun. All right. Um, the whips on the singles when I'm doing three ply sock yarn, um, I try to go for 18. If I can get it slightly finer, like the green, the greeny blue, this was actually slightly finer. It was kind of more like 18 or 20 for my finished wraps per inch. Um, whereas the other one was sort of, it was truly 18, um, which is sort of how I ended up realizing that the yarn was, it was actually slightly different. Um, yeah, I, I try to go for between 18 and 20. Some people would say that that's a more of like a sport and a light sport, but it's still a fingering, like they're still light. And I try to knit my socks tight. Um, I didn't used to knit my socks at a very tight gauge. I used to knit them at sort of a relatively loose gauge. Um, but I have put quite a few holes in some of my commercial socks. And so I realized that I really had to knit them at a tighter gauge. Um, and so I've been really trying to make a concerted effort to knit my socks quite a bit tighter. Um, and if it hurts my hands to knit on them, I just don't get them finished as quickly. All right. Only knitting will show the real weight of the yarn in hand spun, I find. Yeah, you're so right, Rebecca. That is what I have found. You can wrap as much as you want and you can get a general idea, but until you start actually knitting, it, you don't really know, even with commercial yarn. Um, you know, because if you knit really loosely on one project and then you're super stressed with another project, you're going to knit a lot tighter. Um, yeah, just depends. <coughs> on the finished three ply. So 18 wraps per inch on the finished three ply. So I would spin them at roughly 32 to 34 wraps per inch for the singles, if that makes sense. All right. Let me show you the fiber that I couldn't find that I finally found. And then we will say goodbye. Okay. So I bought this fiber. There is a little bit of a story. It was before I was a guild member um, and I spun and I, so I was walking into the, we have an artisan sale every year, which I've talked about on the show before. And um, I w wasn't a guild member yet, but I had gotten back to spinning and I'd gotten back into using my wheel. And um, uh, I, I knew my friend Diana by then who blogs over at 100 Mile Wear um, and her and I had been chatting, but I haven't really made the commitment yet to the guild. And we always have a wool room every year, so you can for the spinners that come, and so you can walk through, and there's there's you know fiber and hand dyed fiber and all different kind of things. And I saw that my friend Margaret, who is Semiamu Suffix, um, which I've spun lots of her fiber on the show, and I've talked about her. You guys all know who she is. I saw this bag sitting under the counter, and I asked her about it, and I said, "Oh, what's that?" And she said, "Oh, it's this llama roving." with silk and it's been carded together. Um, it's been like processed properly in a mill 
Um, it was um, from a mill in the interior, and I think it was actually from the mill that's in Kamloops before it shut down. So it's quite old. Um, it was 530 grams. She was asking $63 for it, and she was selling it on behalf of her friend who have llamas up in the Okanagan. So um, I asked her if I could look at it and if I could like really pull it right out. And I was so blown away by it that I just bought it. Um, and then I didn't know what to do with it because I was relatively new to coming back to spinning. And this is what it looks like. It's still like fresh off of the like equipment. So I don't want to mess up the like what it looks like. But the yellow is actually the silk that's been carded into it. So it's pin drafted roving, which is why I think it's from Kamloops, because that's where that equipment exists that can process llama and alpaca. And um, this is what it looks like up close. There are still some guard hairs in it. Um, and it's um, just this lovely tawny brown color. And the silk doesn't run through all of it. Like I'll show you over here on the, on the other camera. Um, there are places where there is no silk but um, it's just gorgeous. And I think I've mentioned on previous shows that I get really sniffly and sneezy when I'm around alpaca um, and I get like almost like allergy type symptoms, but that hasn't happened with this llama at all. So I'm thinking it's just alpaca and not llama. Um, and so this is the silk that's running through it. Isn't that gorgeous? And I, I just said that my favorite color is this color. So, I mean, you guys can imagine when I saw this, like I was like, well, I have to have that. <laughs> so it's been sitting in my stash for, um, I think it's been sitting in my stash for three years, I think. Um, and every time I would pull it out and pick it out, I just was so bowled away with it um, that I just sort of, you know, didn't really know what to do with it. And it's so ultra fine. I think it must be a... Um, um, like a baby llama. It must be a younger llama. Like it's so fine. Um, oh, Rebecca wants another close up. So I'll just bring it up. And you guys can really see. It's, it's just, it's just incredible. Like it's just amazing. So 530 grams. So you guys will remember my, I feel like I have a baby. Um, I, uh, you guys will remember that I just spun all that pin drafted roving um, from Disdaro Ranch from up in Kamloops as well. Um, and I had split the roving, let's see if I can find the end. I had split the roving like this all the way and I had ended up with like this really fine yarn and it's my sparkle cardigan, which is actually underneath my other one because I'm just storing it right now. Um, that That's what that this yarn is. And it's spun up into this like glorified lace weight kind of fingering weight yarn, which is amazing for that cardigan. Don't get me wrong. I didn't want another 2,000 yards of yarn of lace weight to have to use. Like I just was like the thought of having another massive spin like that when I've got the Melanie Berg shawl and this sparkle cardigan. Like I was just feeling a bit overwhelmed on the like really super fine spin. Um, and the funny thing is, is when I started spinning it, it actually didn't really lend itself to being spun really super thin. I found it kept breaking. Um, the singles weren't really loving it. Um, and so I started playing around with the different settings on my Lendrum and I, I'm spinning it at um, 12 to 1 on my Lendrum and um, and a little bit thicker. So the, so the finished yarn will be more like 14 to 12 wraps per inch and it's just a little bit thicker. Um, and so my finished yarn, I'm hoping, will kind of look like this. And it'll just be a little bit thicker and a little bit more um, 
yeah, just, just not quite as fine. Um, and I'm thinking actually that it's going to be some sort of a cowl. Um, maybe if I have enough yardage, it could be like a vest or a heavier shawl. Um, years and years and years ago, I saw at one of our local yarn shops, um, Three Bags Full on Main Street, for those who know that shop, she had, um, let me just get the camera and focus here, um, she had brought in um, a sample knitter and it was when Cascade Ecological Wool was first on the market and was first available and the sample knitter had knit up a swallowtail shawl in an a, in the Cascade Eco and so she only did the first chart of the swallowtail shawl and if those of you who remember if you've been knitters since like 2006 2005 you'll remember this shawl it was um, in interweave knits it would it like took was it by Evelyn Clark I think it like took the knitting world by storm like everybody made a swallowtail shawl and um, I've knit a couple of them I've knit I think I've knit two of them um, I gave one of them to my sister-in-law and I gave the other one to my mom and um, I was actually kind of thinking that that I might knit my own finally for myself out of this yarn because um, I'd probably do it on like five millimeter needles because um, gauge doesn't matter it's a big shawl um, and I'd have my own like massive swallowtail. I was also thinking about the Juneberry by Brooklyn Tweed by Jared Flood, but it's a lace weight shawl. It's done with their lace weight yarn. And um, I don't want to leave this as singles. I want to ply it. So um, lamb is not going to, and silk is not going to hold its block um, like a wool will and because this isn't blended with wool it's a hundred percent llama with the alpa with the lace it's gonna have incredible drape but it's not gonna hold like a really beautiful block so I wanted to make something that would be a little bit more like that I wouldn't use a ton it would be something really special to pull out um, and yeah so that's kind of where my mind is going um, yeah, Rebecca, Rebecca remembers the swallowtail. It was everywhere. Everybody knit one. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, it's. I think you can actually get it for free now. I think it's one of those patterns that Interweave has kind of released. You can get. Um, it's quite a simple pattern for those who are new to knitting lace. Um, it's more of a traditional lace pattern. It's it's not some of this new stuff that's coming out now. Um, but it's a really effective shawl. It's got some nups in it. Some people didn't do the nups. They did beading. Some people just skipped them all together. Um, it was just a really cool shawl. <laughs> I don't know why everybody was so taken with it. It was just a really cool shawl. Um, but very traditional. So that's kind of what I'm thinking with this yarn and that's what I'm thinking that I'm going to do because it's um, it's it's going to be thicker um, and hopefully I'll get through it quicker. I haven't divided obviously because it's still in its original bat form. Um, I haven't divided it up so I don't know how much yardage I'm going to get onto each bobbin. The Lendrum bobbins are a little bit smaller than my um, Magicraft bobbins. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep filling bobbins and label them like I like I do when I'm doing bigger spins. So this one will get a, a number one on it. The second one will get a number two, three, and so on. I'll probably, I, I suspect this will be like a five or six bobbin spin. So then I'll apply bobbin number one, this one, with bobbin number six, bobbin number two with bobbin number five, bobbin number four with bobbin number five. Uh, three and so then the singles that I spun at the beginning will be applied with the singles I spun at the end and that helps to keep your yarn more consistent because the reality is as much as we have like control cards and we've got you know wraps per inch cards and we try to keep our spinning the same it does change a little bit as you go through your project so and just the excitement of getting towards the end of a project let's face it you just spin faster so um I love the look of those coils when they come right out of the mill. Aren't they amazing? I don't want to lose. I don't want to leave. This is called a coil. Some people call them bats. Some people call them bumps. Um, you'll often see dyers um, talk about these as bumps. Um, I just love what they look like, and I don't like to wreck it if I get one. I like to leave it intact. The my Shetland that I got from um, Disdero Ranch in the big big bag, um, it's still in its perfect bump, and so I don't want to like mess it up. <laughs> Um, yeah, so 
really gorgeous yarn. I'm really enjoying this project. I really needed something that was just purely for me that was just um, a little bit of an escapism kind of a project. I've been doing a lot for the show and a lot of spinning for the show, um, which I love doing and I love creating all that content. But I needed a kind of a project that was just for me. The idea was that I was going to finish this during um, Tour de Fleece. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so I'm just going to chip away at it and I'll get it done when I get it done. Uh, before I sign off, since today's show has proven to be quite long because of our technical difficulties at the beginning, um, does anybody have any questions before we sign off and say goodbye? And I think what I'll do, because this show ended up being really quite long, um, I think we will release the kind of bonus episode separately. So you can look for that over the next week or two. It'll come out as sort of as episode um, 101. I talk about my socks in that. The kids have a little cameo that they do. And um, so it'll, it's almost like you'll be watching back in time. So you, if you want to watch that one first, for those who are here with the live stream, um, maybe wait for that one and watch it first because things will make a little bit more sense. Um, yeah, so. I know. Thank you, Rebecca. She says, congratulations on episode 100. I can't believe it's episode 100. I never thought we would get to 100. It's just amazing. Um, I figured the show would fold sort of between like 25 and 50 episodes, and here we are in the triple digits. So thank you to everybody. Thank you for continuing to support the show. Um, even if you're not a patron subscriber, which, you know, it's not for everyone, um, I just want to say thank you to those who are, you know, view the show weekly and or like when it, every time it comes up, um, you know, returning viewers who are, who are dedicated to the show, who pop into the Ravelry thread and, and, um, and introduce themselves and say hello. And to those who are new, um, I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope that um, we'll, we'll see you here next time. To those who are patrons of the show, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And um, I just, your support of the show is, I just, there's so much gratitude there for me. So thank you so much. Um, uh, there's one more question. Can you just leave your lace weight singles as singles? I've been wondering about weaving with my hand spun singles instead of plying. Absolutely. So it just depends on the fiber content. Um, it just depends on what your plans are and what you want to do. Um, if you're going to weave with your singles, you're just not going to pull on them as hard if you're using them for um, weft. If you're using your singles as, as warp, which they did for thousands of years, even though people say that you can't do it, you absolutely can. You just have to make sure you have enough twist in there to withstand the pressure of the warp pulling at either end. So, um, yeah. If your singles are tough enough, you can definitely weave with them. Exactly, Becca. I couldn't have said it better myself. Okay, guys, until next time, happy spinning. I hope you're enjoying wonderful weather where you are, and um, I will chat with you next time. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.